<laughs> liquid nitrogen, my finger. On Drake Briefly. Cardone. TLDs to monitor our radiation dosage as we work. But radiation dosage here is extremely low. Every year my report comes back that shows that I've received a dosage that's too small to even measure. And I've been here 11 years, so I've never received any dosage that's even strong enough to measure. Wow. Well, How does this work? You wear it? You wear it, right. And, and uh, it, it detects radiation. Huh. And then no, it doesn't beep. Received it, something? No, it doesn't beep. It's just uh, once a month, uh, they come by, they collect them all, and they test them all, and then they, they, they let you know what your dosage was for the month. But like I said, the radiation dosages here are so low that our visiting scientists don't even have to wear them. They're really just for people who work here every day, and they're really only for uh, if, if, if an accident happens, really. Yeah. You used to roll a blade, really? Yeah. They didn't like people, that. People didn't like that. <laughs> well, you could get around the lab a lot faster on rollerblades. I mean, it's a perfect yeah. floor for it. The x-rays come out of the synchrotron, and they travel down this beam pipe, and we use various instruments to focus and steer yep. the x-rays all the way down until they get to here. And then in here, we have our biological samples mounted on the ends of these pins. Let's see here, I'll put it under the microscope. The little biological samples will be on that ring, and they'll be hit with the x-rays that come through. As the x-rays pass through the, the crystallized biological samples, um, there's, a, there's a process called diffraction. The diffraction comes out and hits this CCD detector. Oh. Like a prism with light, it just splits yeah. it Yeah, yeah. But it's sort of, it's sort of like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, laser pointers where you put something on the front of it and it makes a, like, a, like a picture or something. Yeah, yeah it, it's the same sort of principle as that. Oh. So I'm going to show you what the pattern is like. Okay. So this is, this is the diffraction pattern that comes from after the x-rays hit the crystallized sample. This is looking at the face of that CCD detector. Yeah. You get a pattern that looks like this. And then through mathematical relations, we're able to reconstruct what the actual molecule looks like. And the pictures wind up looking a lot like this here. At the end of the day, once we're done doing the mathematical analysis of that, we turn it into this. This tells the biologists something about what they're looking for. And I'm not a biologist, so I couldn't tell you. I don't even know what that molecule is. This is where the electrons go around. I can't take you in there because it's running and it's uh, high, high radiation at the moment. And these are the individual beam lines. So I just showed you this one here, which is X12. Some of these will be for material science, and some of them will be for biology, and some of them will be for chemistry, and who, who knows what else. The, the samples have to be frozen in order to, to withstand the x-rays for as long as we have to blast them for. So the way we freeze them is we use liquid nitrogen. That's actually what, what this is here. Okay. So this is what we call a cold stream. It streams out liquid nitrogen. It's actually not liquid anymore. There's liquid nitrogen in there. And it streams out. And this stream is about 100 Kelvin. So it's about 100 degrees above absolute zero. And so if you stick your finger under there, you don't want to do it for more than a second or so. Because it's, really it's, it's pretty cold. Yeah. Stick your finger in there. <laughs> that was like the beginning of every bad like scenario growing up with my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Here, try this. Put your finger in that. People have sort of an expectation about liquid nitrogen from what they've seen in television and movies. James Bond, definitely. We're right, or a Terminator 2, or, or Liquid nitrogen. Right, hmm. right. But uh, uh, it really doesn't. It really doesn't happen like that. Yeah. 
Is Sorry. that liquid nitrogen? Yes. Oh my god, that's so cool! So what happens if you stick your finger in that? Like, you need to wear gloves, don't you? Or If you stick your finger in that, briefly, for only a second or so, wow. right? Ah. What happens is your hand vaporizes a layer of air, right, that protects your hand. Huh. Now, if you do it for too long, that layer of protection is going to go away and, and you're going to get frostbite pretty bad. Okay, correct. But, but if you only do it for a second or so. Can you corrupt it with like bacteria from your hands or anything like that? Yeah, or? No. no, liquid nitrogen, my finger. I'm great Briefly. Carrying. Just one? There you oh, go. That was cool. That felt kind of neat. It feels kind of dry, right? Yeah, yeah. it felt dry. Yeah. That is, of course, an enormous, that is, of course, an enormous safety violation, but that's okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yep. just going to boil away and become part of the air. Now, back in... Uh, oh, that feels cool. When I was an undergrad at the lab, uh, we had uh, liquid nitrogen that, um, in, in, in demonstrating it to, to other students, you could take a little bit of it and <gasps> put it in your mouth Oh God! And what would happen was uh, it would it would boil away very quickly, and steam would come out your nose, oh, right? That's uh, awesome. Which is extremely stupid to do because yeah. if you swallow it, you're probably going to die oh, because yeah. it's because it's going to crush your stomach because it's so cold. <sighs> yeah. So it's an important safety tip: don't anybody ever do that. You did that. You <laughs> did. <laughs> that so cool. All right. Crazy college well, days. When you're, when you're 19, you're indestructible and. I've cool. never seen liquid nitrogen before. Like I've never touched liquid so nitrogen like, before. Oh, so Woo. Like amazing science. They were like liquid nitrogen. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. So this is where scientists will, the crystals are grown on oh. trays like this. Yeah. And then the individual crystals are fished out, usually by hand, under a microscope. And then they're brought over, frozen, and then shot with x-rays. and then. Wow. We see what's in there. Yeah. So what is is that involved with making dry ice? Uh, dry ice is similar. Dry ice is uh, frozen carbon dioxide. Okay. This is this is essentially frozen nitrogen. So it freezes at a much lower temperature. I would work until three, four o'clock in the morning and have absolutely no idea what time it was. Do they have rooms where people can sleep if they're Exhausted and to rest. Really. I mean, uh, the library is often used for that. There's yep. some comfortable seats in there, but mm. we don't really have anything dedicated to that. Mm. Well, we probably ought to. This beam line here is uh, X25. This is one of our, our brightest and most popular beam lines. Work done at this beam line on two different occasions uh, has won two different Nobel Prizes. Wow. Yeah, in chemistry. One for studying how water permeates through a, a membrane of the cell wall, and another for studying something called uh, the, the human ribosome. This is the molecule that they built here that won them the Nobel Prize. This is the molecule yeah. that they built here. And so this is X29. This is another one of our very, very popular beam lines. It's very similar to X25, except that X25 is more involved with development work, new ways of doing things, and this one is just kind of like a workhorse. So this beam line is actually the most productive protein crystallography synchrotron beam line in the world. Really? Right, yeah. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. Especially considering that we're working with a very old synchrotron. Right. Yeah. The ring was first constructed in the late 70s, and it started running in the early 80s. Okay. And it's been running non-stop since then. And it's time for a new one. I totally feel like I'm in the science fiction movie right now. <laughs> nope, uh, this is science fact. Yeah. This is real. They take a whole bunch of data, a lot of those images, right? And they come here, and they copy those images onto Disc. On, onto onto DVDs, except that not really anymore because we now produce way too much data yeah. that it no longer fits on a reasonable number of these. It's a relic, and it's only uh, maybe five years old. Wow! And that's, that's how fast these, that's how fast this goes. 
at the new synchrotron across the way, yeah. we're going to produce so much data that even if we were to turn every living person in the world into a biophysicist, we wouldn't have enough biophysicists to analyze all of the data. So what we're doing is we're working very hard on computer programs that can analyze the data for us. Right, right. And so there's a, there's a very big push to do that. It's very exciting. So do you have software so developers here? Yep. Oh, like an army of software developers. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. We're back to the beginning. Oh, wow. Oh, that was quick. Yeah, we went in that door, came out that one. So now we can take a walk across the street. Okay. I'll show you our new baby. Hello. Hi. It was actually my boss. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. right. You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very impressed. Are there ever like real crunch times when you're on a deadline oh, and yeah. people are all working like around the clock? All the time, all the time, yeah. yeah. Once you get into a project, you really kind of want to get it done, so you spend, you basically spend all your time doing it. I mean, we all just love what we do here. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like working on boats. It's yeah, yeah. Depends heavily on the neighborhood. Yeah. Wow. So this is where all of the new beam lines are going to come from. And you see we have a lot of work to do. It's, it's significantly larger than the uh, than NSLS-1. And the beams it's going to produce are going to be several hundred times brighter. Wow. Yeah, so we'll be able to see much smaller. Uh, we'll be able to do the experiments much more quickly. We'll be able to take much more data, like I was telling you. The smaller the synchrotron, the more energy loss you have. You have to pump in ever more energy to get it going faster because as the electrons go around a turn, they emit the x-rays and they lose energy. So you gotta right. put that energy back in. The, lar the larger the ring that you can build, the less severe those turns are. So the less loss of energy you'll have. So we can get them up to much, uh, much higher energies. So this is one of those magnets. This is called a sextopole. These are the magnets that we use to steer the electron beams, or that we will be using to steer the electron beams. This is the pipe that will house the, all, the, all the electrons will be in here, and this is how we'll keep them in line and steer them. Um, so these are straight sections, and over here, these are the little bendy, these are the little bendy sections. It's a bunch of straights and a bunch of curves. Put it all together, and you get a, you know, a big donut looking thing. And this is a magnet? Yep, well That's it's a series of magnets. Wow. Magnet, 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 magnet. So each, each one of these is a very powerful magnet that we use for steering the beam. And they're powered by electricity. Yep. They, you yep. can control their strength. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think what's going to happen here is that there'll be an insertion, what's called an insertion device here. So there'll be um, a different set of series of magnets where it'll be uh, north, south, north, or north, south, and south, north, and north, south, south, north, alternating, right? Okay. And what that'll do is as the electron beam comes through, it'll wiggle it. Because these electrons are moving at nearly the speed of light, the radiation that comes off from that wiggling will become x-rays. And then it'll spray down into our beam lines, which we'll build after that wall. Once this thing is running, this whole tunnel area will be closed off. You won't be able to come in. This, this is what I couldn't show you at the other, at yeah. the other, because it was running. What do you think is the future of synchrotrons? Like, do you think we'll ever build them in orbit? Honestly, no, I don't think so. I think facilities like this, I think this will be one of the last of its type that's built. Really? I think that it's probably in the, in the, in the somewhat distant future, it's going to be replaced by, uh, by other types of devices called X-ray free electron lasers. Huh. Um, or like tabletop devices that are that are much that are much more powerful, mm. but those are you know sort of not ready for not ready for the applications that we need them for, huh. and they're not going to be ready anytime soon. Um, but I but I, I would predict that they're going to be uh, uh, they're they're going to be what replaces 
when, when we're old. When we're old men. Yeah. <laughs> Rocking chair. We'll sit in rocking chairs. And I remember right. when. Right, right, right. <laughs> I was remember the age. Assist. Remember the age of the synchrotrons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Think you guys will ever invent time travel here at Brookhaven? <laughs> if you study uh, uh, relativity and Einstein, if you if you can um, travel yourself at velocities close to the speed of light relative to the Earth, you will perceive time to go very slow while the time on the Earth will, relative to you, will be going very fast. So you will appear to travel into the future. If you only could, you know, uh, get your velocity up relative to the Earth to near the speed of light, then yeah, you could travel pretty far into the future, or arbitrarily far into the future. Maybe someday. But you can't come back. No, you can't come back. <laughs> you can't come back, yeah. Maybe someday we'll have an enormous machine like this that Somebody gets into a little egg and starts going around in a circle until they get that fast. Or... I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, well, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. You know, definitely come back and check it out. We'll it'll, be back in three look, years. Yeah it'll, yeah, it'll look very different when you come back in three years. Yeah, wow. definitely contact me. I will. Yeah, yeah. I remember will. this. Remember this scene, and I'll bring you back here in three okay, years. We'll have to come right back up to yeah. this platform. Yeah. Brookhaven Lab is a state-of-the-art research laboratory. We build mostly particle accelerators. It started off originally building nuclear reactors and moved into particle accelerators, which I became, I suppose you could say, uh, uh, an expert uh, compared to most people. And um, uh, it was very stressful. We were building things that had never been built before. Uh, you weren't quite sure if it was going to work. And, uh, there were a lot of very critical physicists waiting to use these machines if it didn't work, so you had to be damn careful. And um, uh, I found that coming home and working on the boat was tremendous therapy. I uh, see. Tremendous. Wow. You know, I could vent my uh, frustrations on a piece of wood. <laughs>